Welcome back to the show, and for once, it's news that might actually impact you right now-ish, because NVIDIA have maybe came to their senses after the initial launch of the 40 series. We've got a whole raft of new cards and a whole bunch of repricing. AMD seemingly have a value king for us, and uh, hey, those handheld dreams, they're actually coming a little bit closer because Intel are now also entering the ring. That is big for competition. Elsewhere, Sony are footing a rather hefty bill from the French because... Well, uh, apparently, they've uh, they found that they've been intentionally breaking third-party controllers, so that's a little naughty. And then the publisher of Gollum, Nacon, Nacon always do great things, maybe we'll talk about that more someday, but Nacon have finally released their grip on Frogwares, and we've got a release date for what's honestly one of the coolest projects that I've seen in years. And look at this, oh my god, it's bellular.ghost.io on your screen. That's where we publish a loading screen five times a week, it's where you can get all the news, all the stuff that we do earlier and and free, and where you get to hang out with us on the Discord Members Lounge. That's also the best way to support the show, because hey, AdSense Revenue sure ain't gonna do that. Okay, thanks members for all of your support. With that said, let's jump into things. Obviously starting with, uh, yeah, NVIDIA. Buying graphics cards has been hell. Maybe it's still going to continue to be hell, but at least the prices will be a bit different. So CES happened, and with that, NVIDIA have outlined the 40 Super Series, which basically is kind of like the next generation on the, like, the 4000 Series cards. But, I mean, eh, these Supers are more like a bit of a spec bump, um, I would say, between, you know, larger, uh, sort of larger generations. But in the past, they have made really good value propositions. So here's basically the deal. Here is the lineup. Now, this is the lineup in terms of recommended retail price. Good luck getting all of this, potentially even for a reason I'll get into soon. Number one, the 4090 still is king at $1,599. Oddly enough, while it's super expensive, it did actually represent a very good value. There are some cards like earlier on in that product stack that had nowhere near the performance per dollar that you would expect compared to uh, the 4090. It was an interesting thing. But then we've got the 4080 Super coming in at $999 the 4070 Ti Super bit of a mouthful, is $799, 4070 Super, $599, then we've got the 4070 dropping down to $549, the 4060 Ti there at $399, and of course the 4060 at $299. Where I think this will be interesting is a lot of people will have looked at, say, the 3070. They'll have seen the 3070 secondhand can be like, you know, in times like quite a bit less than a 4060 Ti, maybe about the same price as a 4060, and for pure raster performance kind of seemed like the pick. So I suppose if that was your determination, there's not really much here to change that at the lowest end. For things to take note of, right, the 4080 is gone. Coming in at 1199 for its RRP, it basically didn't make much sense. So it's been retired. The 4070 Ti at $799 is gone. And the replacement 4080 Super has a $200 sort of discount compared to the otherwise pricing, which uh, does feel, I would say, a little bit more sane. When we actually take a look at what they're really pitching here, clearly they're talking about like this as an upgrade from the 2000 and the 3000 series. Here in their average performance of 18 games with an i9-12900K at 1440p, DLSS 2.0, uh, of, and ray, ray tracing in games that support it. So again, I think those are um, meaningful distinctions, but they're basically pitching in terms of relative performance, saying you've got an RTX 2070, yeah, get an upgrade. It'll be at least three times faster. So that's what they're showing off. More notably, they're not comparing this to the 4000 series. They don't expect people, I think, to upgrade from existing 4000 series cards. And to be honest with you, as I look at this now, this actually just feels like a 4000 series that makes a bit more sense as opposed to whatever the hell they did initially. Now, of course, one of the things they're super keen to show off is the frame gen performance increases. I mean, hey, would you rather play Alan Wake 2 at four or five frames per second, or would you rather play it at over 60 with a 4070 Super? Which, I mean, yeah, it's, it's frame gen, and obviously, like, one of the things here, they're also using ray tracing on games that support it, which will disproportionately slam those older cards. So really, this is the absolute best case for the new cards and definitely more of a worst case for the old cards. I mean, as an example, I owned a 2000 series card. I owned the initial RTX um, sort of wave. And yes, they were saying, hey, RTX ops. Remember that that they used to talk about? Um, but realistically, for any game, turning ray tracing on made absolutely no sense. 
sense. Really, to me, that with ray tracing, it more seemed like NVIDIA kind of just making some uh, differentiation, right? Trying to push that technology where they feel that they had a leg up over AMD. And obviously, we've seen that play out over time. For a more fair comparison, we've got the games without frame generation where things look uh, less ridiculous and a bit more fair. But overall, that is that situation. But it does interface with another situation, which is NVIDIA's stock price. Take a look at this graph. It gets rather big. Yes, they've been raking in money, and this has all been off generative AI. Now, this is uh, where graphics cards are extremely powerful, even to the point where some export uh, bans from the US have actually been uh, been implemented because, I suppose, global competition. Hey, let's, let's keep the 4090s for us. But what that has meant, though, is quite a few cards going out of stock. I'm not going to say that it's literally another uh, sort of repeat of the whole crypto situation. That was very fun if you're trying to upgrade your computer, but perhaps something like that will happen because one of the things that they did very much tout here with their super cards is their generative AI capabilities, which does, of course, then make us all think, will this have increased demand from corporate buyers who will be buying extremely high volumes of cards? As an example, the amount of competition over 4090s for Gen AI has been completely insane. If these cards are still pretty damn good, if they're good in terms of performance per watt, maybe we will see corporate buyers just gobbling up a lot of that stock and realistic prices for gamers going way, way up, which absolutely would suck. Now, for some broad strokes here, number one, we've got NVIDIA marketing material, not tests from people that we would trust. Some impressions that uh, I will cite, though, from experts such as Digital Foundry are that the 4080 Super price more closely aligns with its value prop than the 4080 did. So the 4070 Ti Super getting the AD103 GPU is a very good step up, so that should be hopefully good sort of uh, performance per dollar, and it's a bit more nebulous with the 4070 Super. And the final word for this segment is NVIDIA. What are they actually thinking? I think there's two ways that we can look at this. Number one, that they looked at the market, they really realized that they had priced the middle ground of the 40 series far too high, that they were not getting those sales, and it just wasn't a great situation. And therefore, they're walking back, and they're maybe doing pricing that the market will actually accept to get them some sales. Now, that's... Uh may be a load of bollocks, because the other way we could read this is that they priced the 40 series incredibly high, intentionally knowing that eventually they could just do the super series to pick up everybody else who didn't jump into the initial wave of cards. And I absolutely do think that it is the latter. That's just what makes the most sense to me, honestly. Okay, there is more news though. This time we're going to hop over to AMD. And very much unlike recent NVIDIA news, this is one that's really big for those of us who are caring about value. The first thing then is a new bunch of their APUs, which is actually pretty cool because APU plus frame generation actually does equal a pretty damn good sort of like, you know, 1080p, 1440p machine. So that's actually pretty exciting for plenty of people. Now for the dedicated GPUs, they've got the RX 4600 XT. This is coming in at the more entry level. Its RRP is $329. And their pitch with this card, right, is that it will let people stay in budget and get up to 1440p, mainly through improvements to the memory and clock speeds. Going into the graphs they're showing, basically they're pitching this as an upgrade to people on in and around an RTX 2060, where, yeah, it's obviously going to be a significant upgrade. And then, of course, just being a little bit more ready for 1440p. I will say they're saying average FPS at 1440p max settings. Of course, if you've actually tried to properly optimize uh, the settings for a game, which at this price range will absolutely, yes, be doing, Often max settings is stupidly inefficient. There are some settings that just take up a hell of a lot of frame rate, right? They're really expensive, but they can't really be noticed in realistic gameplay scenarios. So that's overall that situation there. Seems like a pretty good value card. Obviously, we do want to have third-party independent benchmarks. Now, this actually matters a hell of a lot because while we may talk about the big Halo products and they're all exciting to look at and the cool, amazing PCs that people build, realistically, 60% of Steam users in and around there use 1080p monitors or are still using, as an example, the RTX 2060 or below. That's a very significant proportion of Steam's audience. That's why the Steam hardware survey is absolutely amazing. And it's totally why, in both cases, actually, that sort of level of the 2000 series is being used as a point of comparison. So ultimately, then, this is a good option that exists for AMD. It's not going to fundamentally change things up, though, which is the bit that's unfortunate, as we've covered on this channel quite a few times. When you look at the Steam hardware survey, 
the difference just percentage wise between AMD and Nvidia is absolutely ginormous. Intel is there with a little bit of a sliver with its uh, initial ARC cards. I suppose the best we can hope is the next generation of ARC actually starts igniting some uh, proper competition in that lower end, which is totally where I'd like to see Nvidia be a lot more competitive because yeah, sure, big fancy 4090, but that's not relevant to the vast majority of people. What we want is true competition in that low to medium end. Now, Speaking of competition, this next thing is really good news, and it's Intel jumping into the fray. And it is the CLAW. Yes, the MSI CLAW A1M. I've seen some people say that it's a stupid name for something, but to be honest, I don't know. CLAW, you just want to scream it. I think it's a sort of word that, um, honestly, yeah, it's a bit of a silly product name, but it will kind of stick in your head, so it probably has worked. Now, this is basically everything that you would expect coming in at $699, which of course is uh, you know, fairly good for what these things are. I will say that the Steam Decks are still, like those, even the base model Steam Deck is an absolutely killer value. Uh, the thing though is, this has got out to some of the press as an example. There's a Dave2D video on it. However, he was not able to share full performance stuff, I assume because of embargoes. What is important here though, is that it's using the Intel Core Ultra 7 155H from the Meteor Lake family. And that basically means that Intel are now producing chips that can go in these handhelds where previously it was pretty much all AMD stuff. That's really good because competition in this emerging product category is, uh, is just really, really important. Now, there is one other little area to that competition that could be quite relevant. To take a look at, say, your, uh, you know, your iPhone or even, you know, these Macs, right, which uh, basically have absolutely inhuman performance for the wattage. Because, yes, you can absolutely crush, uh, you know, what Apple will sell you as the absolute, you know, the best thing ever in some, I don't know, M3 Ultra Mac Studio something. Yeah, is that going to be destroyed by a 4090? Probably. Will it be a lot more efficient per watt? Yes, and it is that efficiency per watt that actually matters here at that lower level. A good example is that in this product category, one of the things people look for is not just how powerful it is, but it's actually how low can they drop the wattage? How much can they bring that performance down so that playing non-demanding games, say purely like 2D stuff, indie games, maybe some emulation, so that they can stretch out their battery life. In this case, we are looking with a base TDP of 28 watts and a 53 watt hour battery. Now for what Dave got, that is a pre-release unit. Again, we're just going to have to wait to see uh, like full testing. What I will personally be very interested for though, is whenever we actually get something on ARM, because this is all x86 stuff, that's all really cool. But when you're moving over to ARM, which is going to be what's running at your phone, basically, or I mean, really anything else, um, you get way better performance per watt as seen in Apple Silicon. What has been exciting recently is Qualcomm are actually talking up their uh, ARM side of things. So if there is more stuff moving in the direction of ARM, perhaps we can get some sort of nice hardware translation layers. One really good example of that is Rosetta, which is the one that Apple made that basically ran way better than anybody expected it would if we could get something like that in, you know, an operating system that people actually use to play video games which would be relevant to one of these handhelds, then perhaps we could get that ungodly performance per watt actually in one of these devices. And that I think is where things would get truly, well, to be honest with you, pretty damn thrilling because not only would they then be fantastic for their core gaming use, you could just dock that sucker into a monitor with a mouse and keyboard and away you go. You would almost have your everything device. So certainly I think within the next five years, we're going to have things that we could have only dreamed of years ago, and that's exciting. Let's blast out a few stories before I've got a game that I think a lot of you are going to want to play. Okay, Sony have been fined by the French for breaking third-party controllers. Now, it's not the biggest fine ever. It's 13.5 million euro, and it basically is a case brought by a French third-party peripheral manufacturer called Subsonic. They took Sony to task for engaging in bad practices around how they're handling third-party controller stuff on the PS4 over a period of four years. Now, this is fairly interesting. Uh, there's two main points, right? One of them is Sony using anti-counterfeiting measures, which, yes, do that, but also 
disproportionately make it a right pain in the ass for people doing third-party controllers, which essentially would lead to users having a bad experience of controllers disconnecting and that kind of thing, where yes, there's Sony's intent, but then the hidden side benefit for Sony is third-party controllers are less of a good, stable experience. Therefore, people think badly of third-party controllers and they buy Sony ones, which obviously are expensive, high markup, high margin items. And then the second part of their complaint is basically Sony made getting the license to basically do a legitimate controller. They made that nearly impossible because an opaque, this is a quote, licensing policy, which in several cases prevented rival companies that wanted to market PS4 compatible controllers from joining the OLP partnership program. And of course, that's important. People do want the safety of having an official thumbs up. So basically, well, the court said, yeah, that sucks. Uh, fair enough. You're right. They find Sony. I suppose we'll see how this will go. I mean, maybe this is a case, a precedent. Maybe other people will uh, bring some claims. We'll have to see. The next thing then is the publishers of Lord of the Rings Gollum, Nacon. It's weird with Nacon. They're not important enough to be talked about uh, that much, even though, to be honest, they're continually a big shit show. If you remember the story around Frogwares, they basically made this game called The Sinking City. Really cool game. They cut their teeth doing loads of Sherlock Holmes games. So they actually really do this kind of like mystery uh, Lovecraft situation. They were really strong. The thing is though, stuff immediately turned into a shit show. Basically, funding dates were missed by Nacon. They were threatening to withhold profits. They removed Frogwares logo from marketing materials, including some console box box art, which sucks. They bought up domain names related to Frogwares' IP. They launched a tabletop RPG without telling them, which is kind of hilarious and weird. And then there's a whole situation of Nacon basically being accused of attempting to release a pirated version of the game onto a third-party subscription service. So all of this was lovely. Uh, big old situation. They ended up having to DMCA take down their own game from Steam, which must have been lovely. And the good news is that actually we've got somewhat of a resolution here because the publishing rights, all that stuff has went back to Frogwares. And that basically means they get to release the game the way that they want. And if they want to say, do some DLC or anything like that, they're able to, but yeah, a win for a developer that deserved a win. And uh, I mean, hey, Nacon, oh man, <laughs> they keep on just doing the bangers. And finally, some really good news, and that is Fallout London has got its, uh, its release date. Fallout London is a bloody impressive piece of work. Just take a look after this video at the initial gameplay showcase that they showed off. It is truly impressive from a modding team. This is a modding team whose work was actually so strong that people on that team ended up leaving because they got hired in the games industry, as an example, by Bethesda. So that's quite the story. We showcased them a bit last summer, I believe, going through all the details. It looked fantastic. The slices of gameplay that they showed off, great. The world building that they've done, looks rich, looks interesting. It absolutely looks like a slice of Fallout that I would love to dive into, especially because, well, you know, England, UK, haven't really got that in Fallout as much. I'm really keen to see what their view on that's like. I wanna see what that culture is going to be like, you know, interfaced with uh, sort of nuclear fallout. All pretty cool. Now, this had been delayed. Number one, delayed to avoid Starfield and then delayed again because they wanted to do more testing and that sort of thing. And ultimately, that is why it's coming out on St. George's Day, which, uh, yeah, makes sense because the game's set in England. And that is April the 23rd of this year, which is a little bit after the Fallout TV show happens. So I suppose a lot of the Fallout stonks will be up. Certainly, if you're feeling that itch to play Fallout, to be honest with you, like Fallout 4 is okay. New Vegas, fantastic. But maybe you want some new Fallout, you don't feel like playing Fallout 76. I think it's absolutely fantastic that this game, touch wood, will actually exist for people to get stuck into. So that's pretty damn sick. Ultimately, that is it for today's episode. We will be back pretty much with as close to daily videos as we can uh, in the new year. We're all very fired up to uh, honestly just get back to work for you. You can check out badlyorder.ghost.io in the description of this video. It's the best way to support us. Get a little bit more content as well. You can actually get a look at loading screen, which we publish every single day. And by the way, on the front of the URL, we finally worked out what the problem is and uh, the process to get a real URL that isn't the .ghost.io, yeah, that's, um, that's on the way. All right, that's it for me. Have a great day. See you next time.